country with a GDP of 415 billion, the seventh largest oil reserve in the world, the 17th most competitive economy, and the tallest building in the world, standing 878 meters tall. This is the UAE. These numbers alone might show incredible innovation and strength within the economic model of this country, but that's only the beginning. What really sets the UAE apart from the rest is the country's only half a century old. So how does a country go from refineries to riches in only 52 years? First, we'll go into the history and background of the state. Then we'll go into our levels of analysis, including a national level, a regional level, and an international level. Finally, we'll discuss the challenges and solutions of the UAE's future. To begin, it's important to go back in time, specifically back to the 1960s, when it all began. To understand how the UAE was able to become as successful as it has, it is necessary to look to the past. In 1968, the UAE had only 180,000 inhabitants who mainly survived off of the profits brought about by the agriculture, pearling, and fishing industries. It is important to note that the UAE did not exist and was rather a territory upon which there were seven different independent monarchies known as the Trucial States, which had previously been colonized by the British. However, the decline of the British led to the creation of the Trucial Council, which ultimately unified these states. Soon after, they discovered their vast oil reserves. In 1971, their unified security concerns over keeping the wealth of this oil led to their union as a single state, with each emirate retaining a certain degree of autonomy. However, this development did have initial challenges. First of all, its infrastructure was extremely limited in the early 70s and the majority of it was constructed with the help of foreign aid, which created a dependence. And secondly, it was faced with the task of developing in a largely volatile Arab world surrounded by the Iran-Iraq war and the Arab-Israeli question. However, it was this instability that allowed the other Gulf monarchies to create the Gulf Cooperation Council, which established the UAE's relationships with other future giants of the region like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Kuwait. At this point, it's worth evaluating the UAE's development here using Walt Rostow's stages of economic growth to help illustrate the path it took to get to its current state. Rostow's stages help us understand what steps a state needs to take to become economically successful, or as Rostow terms it, reach high mass consumption. He posits that there is a drive to development which requires the correct conditions to be able to occur. At this specific point in history, in 1971, it had, uh, the UAE had progressed through the first two stages. Firstly, traditional society, when its economy was still primarily dependent on subsistence agriculture and fishing. And secondly, preconditions to take off as it began to open up to other Gulf states. As it continued its development, the individual emirates of the UAE chose to develop further in different ways as they progressed to stages three and four of Rostow's model, take off and drive to maturity. Abu Dhabi had the most oil, so it didn't have a need to diversify its economy and became incredibly wealthy because of it. This also turned Abu Dhabi into the capital as it rode off of the 70s and 80s oil boom. Meanwhile, Dubai had much less oil and therefore it decided to pursue other business ventures. Dubai pursued construction and infrastructure projects such as an airport, constructing the World Trade Center, the Burj Khalifa, Emirates Airline, and also ports to connect it to the trade across the Gulf. All of these efforts ultimately turned Dubai into a business and tourism capital, which brought in massive amounts of foreign investment. So it was both oil and tourism which had brought UAE to the fifth stage of Rostow's model, high mass consumption. However, there's another valuable way of examining the UAE's development. Historian Alexander Gershon Kron's backwardness model takes into account things such as leapfrog technologies and the relative gap to development that poor countries like the UAE had compared to richer countries like the USA in the time. In essence, it says that the larger the gap between the developing poorer nation and the most developed states of the time, the more likely certain conditions are. The UAE is a great example of the fulfillment of these conditions. For example, some of these include that capital-intensive production will be more prioritized than labor-intensive production, which is exactly what's happened as, it, as like the UAE has shifted to a more financial and tourism-based hub versus the oil as it's trying to diversify. Secondly, there's a large reliance on borrowed technologies, therefore the UAE isn't a producer of things such as tech or oil technology, but rather uses them. Thirdly, there's a large need for special institutions like the state to bring physical and human capital to these industries, which is also exactly what's happening with the presence of such a state-heavy influence in all of its enterprise. Under both of these models of development, the UAE's short but extremely productive development story can be termed as a highly developed state based off of its economic success. On a national level, 
A general outlook of the government can lead us to believe that the UAE runs under a form of state capitalism. Characterized by their two largest emirates, Abu Dhabi and Dubai, these emirates metamorphosed from little more than fishing and pearl diving bases into global financial and trading hubs. An examination of dependency, neoliberalism, and the resource curse theory would characterize the rapid socioeconomic expansion as an exceptional case. This is in due to the fact that the city's political economy is deeply immersed in state-led, state-centric systems. The UAE has emerged as a quintessential exemplar of a new brand of authoritarian capitalism supported by state-owned, profit-driven entities. According to the economist Ian Bremer, we can understand state capitalism to be a system in which the state functions as the leading economic actor and uses markets primarily for political gain. After the boom of the 1960s with oil, revenue was used on infrastructure projects such as roads, buildings, highways, and more. These projects were kick-started by the government-related entities we hear about. However, this construction resulted in the demand for human labor within the country which caused immigration of nearby populations such as from the Philippines, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Today, almost 90% of the labor force is made up of these alien ethnicities. Because of that, there are two main reasons why a form of state capitalism was most beneficial for the UAE. First, because the necessity to diversify from oil due to the dwindling hydrocarbon reserves persuaded the authorities to focus intently on a process of creating a dirigist state from the 1990s onward. And secondly, because the UAE is a minority state with only 20% locals, and only 0.34% of income from the private sector is made by Emirati citizens. Thus, state capitalism is one way to compensate for a small indigenous private sector while simultaneously deleveraging the hegemonic power of transnational corporations that would take over other ones. Next, we need to get into the factors of production that affected the UAE's growth. Human production is the first one, because globalization plays a crucial role in the development of the UAE in terms of human production. The immigration of foreigners who provide manual labor for, for the country are essential to the development of infrastructure and the plan of diversification for the economy which began in the 1980s. The expansion of sectors like transportation, construction, and technological advancements relies heavily on foreign manpower to succeed. Oftentimes, the UAE is said to be built off the backs of immigrants. Additionally, globalization has also led to the UAE's ability to gain foreign investments and establish relations with powerful transnational corporations. To tailor towards this, Dubai and Abu Dhabi actually have become business-friendly environments with favorable regulations with the objective to promote the cities as trade and finance hubs. Furthermore, Dubai hosted the Expo 2020, giving it massive exposure to large business ventures with the purpose of leading the city-state to be a chief financial trading center akin to Hong Kong or Singapore. Secondly, the greatest factor towards the UAE's current wealth state is the physical factor, based on the country's natural oil reserves. However, despite Richard Audi's resource curse theory, indicating that a resource-rich na nation such as Venezuela or the Congo is doomed to failure, the UAE is a rare phenomenon that breaks this trend. Because though oil is responsible for kickstarting the Emirates economy, it is the final factor that keeps the UAE growing. Organization. Organization is a form of strong central government which has been essential to the growth of this economy, specifically with the help of government-related entities or GREs, state capitalism has allowed for the UAE to support their population economically but also to empower itself on the world stage. Structuralists have emphasized that the Middle East, once an independent society, was under imperialism, turned into a periphery under the Western-dominated world system. But the government of the UAE is using GREs and its geostrategic location to integrate itself into the international political economy via the internationalization of the state. An example of this is Dubai Ports World, a company owned by the state, which was involved in the takeover of rival companies in London and Singapore, 
thus establishing itself as an imminent power on the world stage. Another example is Emirates Airlines, known to be one of the most successful and luxurious airlines, attracting millions of passengers every year, and using soft power to attract more visitors to the UAE. In fact, tourism has accounted for $43.3 billion of the annual GDP in 2020, which is about 12%, and that's estimated to double in the next 10 years. But apart from national level, utilizing human, physical, and organizational factors to succeed nationally, the country excels regionally as well. Additionally, the UAE has continued to make large strides in terms of its regional and international importance. By developing its soft power through development funds for other countries and its hard power through the strong economic ties it's fostered, the UAE has become a regional spearhead. Its focus on finance and digital development have given it a special role in the Arab world. Out of all the Arab worlds, it is by far the most international, even beating out Israel in its sheer number of expats. Additionally, it's also the second largest economy in the Arab League, just behind Saudi Arabia, and the 29th largest GDP in the world after Norway, so it's also had international claim as well. Its soft power is also bolstered by its openness to Western cultures, especially when compared to much more conservative nations that are not so friendly to these cultures, like Qatar, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. And all of these alliances have also been fostered since the beginning with the Gulf Cooperation Council, and they've only continued to grow. For example, its roles in other organizations like OPEC and the Arab League have consolidated its importance in the region and to its allies. Because the UAE is such a small country, the power it gains through these relationships is vital for its continued existence, especially as its economy still relies on oil and therefore is still vulnerable to security concerns. So though it is a regional power, it is by no means completely independent and therefore does face limitations to its sovereignty on an international level. Using a few metrics for development, the UAE still ranks very highly. By looking at its GDP per capita, we can measure the relative wealth of the UAE compared to other countries. Its GDP per capita of 44,000 US dollars per year doubles that of Saudi Arabia and is 10 times that of Iran, a country which holds a similar amount of oil. Additionally, using the Kendrell Self-Anchoring Striving Scale, a measurement which tracks the perceived well-being of citizens as they themselves report it, the UAE still ranks highest in the entire Arab world. And this benefit is recognized far beyond just Emiratis. 44% of young Arabs say they'd like to live in the UAE in 2019, twice as many who voted for its runner-up, Canada. The UAE overall has positioned itself as a, the largest liaison between the West, the East, and the Arab world, giving it an immense amount of influence. Its biggest trade partners are China and the US. So as the great power shift detailed by thinker Patty Ashton occurs, and power transitions East, it's states like the UAE who have opened themselves both up to the East and the West that will reap the benefits of this neoliberal system. So based off of all of these metrics, the UAE can definitely be considered one of the most successful states, both of the region and internationally. Though the UAE has made a lot of progress, there are some notable challenges that it continues to face. Currently, the dependency on oil is unstable and highly volatile, as seen during the pandemic or because of a deficit of resources. It is crucial to diversify to ensure a prosperous future for the nation. However, only Abu Dhabi and Dubai are frontrunners in the diversification plan, while the other emirates lag behind. Also, the main challenge that the government faces is the continued investment in education, technology, and research to create a more highly skilled and motivated Emirati workforce. A brain drain has caused a deficit of skilled workers, as many prefer to live in more westernized countries. But what can they do to fix this? There are a few methods for the next steps that the UAE can take. Firstly, they can continue to diversify the economy, becoming more competitive internationally across other sectors such as aerospace engineering and technology. They can also invest in the other five Emirates in order for them to catch up on this development strategy. Despite the UAE shortcomings though, it is still important to note the great success that it's had through an unconventional development strategy as it utilizes state capitalism to create one of the world's most open markets. And the trends show that the UAE is only getting better. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the UAE went from refineries to riches.